like I said before, it's a pleasure to be with you all in the Lord's house. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Hebrews chapter 10 with me? Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. that you'll all forgive me for being a little bit um, frazzled with all this uh, tonight, um, but we'll uh, continue on. Um, and tonight, looking in the book of Hebrews, uh, we'll be finishing out chapter 10, except next week we'll be, um, we'll be mentioning the last two verses of chapter 10 together. Um, but this week we're going to make a mention of uh, the last verses that we have left in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And what I'd like us to see is just like last week, we looked at that warning passage uh, about, again, us as a congregation and us as a people gathering together and, and continuing in the faith together. Um, this week, I'd like us to look at some comfort that's given to churches uh, about this topic, about perseverance in the faith. And so if you have your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 10, we'll begin reading together in verse 30. The scripture says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days, in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And now let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer together. Father God, we again come before you and we thank you for allowing us to gather in your name tonight. As few as a, of us as there are here, Lord, we just thank you and praise your great name for that opportunity. And Lord, we pray for those who could make it to uh, worship with us tonight for the illness sake, for uh, whatever it is, Lord. We just thank you, uh, Lord, for allowing us to gather and we ask that you would be with those who couldn't make it to gather with us and bring them back to us. Lord, we pray that you would give us all comforts tonight in your word. Lord, we pray that you would help us to uh, see in each other the persevering faith that uh, you've given to us through your son, Jesus. And Lord, we pray you would help us to share that faith with others. Uh, Lord, to show others that Jesus has died on the cross for sinners and that they ought to trust in him. And Lord, that they have the promise of everlasting life if they will. Lord, we ask that you would be with our missionaries where they are. The Lord be with all the churches in our area. And Lord, strengthen them. The Lord, help them to know the uh, powerful and, uh, Lord, the common faith that you've given to all of us. And we just pray that you would help us to be a, a shining light in this world. We ask that you would keep us until the day of Christ Jesus. And, Lord, that you would forgive us where we failed you. And it's in Christ's name we pray it all. Amen. So again tonight, I'd like to uh, mention uh, last week and the warning that we had against apostasy. In verse 30 it says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Even if these people are in the church and among the church, if they do not have faith in Christ, then the Lord says that the Lord shall judge his people. The Lord will even judge 
those that are in the visible church, those that have visible fellowship with believers. And why is it that the Lord will judge them? We saw last week. It's because some of them, it's because those that that have done this, those that have apostatized, have violently rejected Christ even after they had known about him and, and been in the assembly of the church. In verse 29, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Those that have done this, those that have known the way of truth, those that have, uh, that have, been, um, that, that have had the knowledge of Christ and, and been with his saints, and yet they fully rejected him, that they even had the presence of the Holy Ghost among his people, and they rejected and despised that Holy Spirit, it says that these are the ones that God comes in judgment against. In verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In Isaiah 33 and verse 13, hear ye that are far off what I have done, and Ye that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners of Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He says, and he's speaking to those that are near, those that are in God's people. He speaks of the sinners of Zion, the sinners of the church. And he says, who among us shall dwell with devouring fire, and that they are afraid with great fearfulness. And so we saw last week in these passages that God does come in judgment against false professors, those those who have professed Christ in the past, who have been in the church, who have said that they are Christian, and yet they have abandoned Christ. They wanted nothing to do with him. And so what I want us to see this week, last week we saw that, what I'd like us to see this week is what comfort does the preacher in Hebrews give us about our congregation? What what comfort does he give to us that our neighbors in the church, that, that our church members here are genuine believers and that they will be saved as, as well, that we as a church might be saved. And I'd like us to first see that he gives us comfort by looking at the past evidences of the church and of the believers in the church. In verse 32, he says, But call to remembrance the former days, in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction. When it says that after they were illuminated, this means after that they had understood, they had heard and they had understood the gospel. And a comparison here is being made to Hebrews 6 and verse 4. We we remember that warning passage when we went through it. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and so forth, and then in verse 6, If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. The same word, is being used there, illuminated in this passage and enlightened in chapter 6. And he's making a comparison there. In in chapter 6, he used the word about those who had heard the gospel in the church. They were enlightened to the gospel, and yet they turned away from it. They fell away from the gospel by disbelieving in it. But here he says, call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of affliction. In contrast to those apostates in chapter 6, who when they, at the first sign of affliction, they turned away from the gospel, these believers endured it. That these Hebrew believers that this is being written to, they endured the affliction that was brought against them. In verse 33 then, it says, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. They they suffered this fight of afflictions, and the first 
Part of this, he mentions, is that they were made a gazing stock to the world. The sinful world had contempt towards the believers. In John 15, verse 18, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. One of the first things that a new believer will notice about the world when they've come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ is that there's a kind of simmering contempt for believers from the world. Uh, that, that the world um, dislikes the attitude of believers, dislikes the, 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 the position of believers in faith in Christ. Um, and, and so because of that, um, the unbelievers, we see they, they flee away. Um, if, if we don't have something genuine that ties us down to Jesus Christ, then when we confess Christ to the world and we suffer affliction, we have no reason to stay confessors. We have no reason to stay within, within the church. In, in Mark uh, 4 and verse 14, Christ, of course, gives the parable of the sower. And he says, the sower soweth the word. And in verse 16, these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. As soon as persecutions arise in this world, immediately they're offended of Jesus Christ. Immediately they want nothing to do with him because he brought them a discomfort in the world. Uh, in a, a disingenuous believer cannot, cannot associate themselves with Christ and with the church for very long because inevitably and, and very soon the passage says in, 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 in Mark, Afflictions will come, persecutions, the world will hate their profession of Jesus Christ, even the mention of his name. And so, because they have no root, they have no real substance to them, no, no real heart of the faith, therefore they leave. They, they, they abandon Christ and, and, and leave the church. But a true believer will endure it. Just like our passage describes of these Hebrew believers, they will always cling to Jesus Christ by faith. In Jude 1 and verse 29, uh, 24, it says, Unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior. He is able to keep us from falling. He, he is the one that gives us depth in the faith and enough depth even that a new believer who has faith just as a grain of mustard seed, that they will continue in the faith. When afflictions, when persecutions arise, they will not fall away from the faith. Again, that's the contrast being made, that these believers were enlightened and they endured an affliction afterward. And then those that were once enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift, when they fall away, they become apostate, or they were apostate truly the whole time. In verse 33, then it says, it gives us another affliction that they underwent. And partly, whilst ye became companions of them that were so used, of them that were afflicted and had these, these difficulties, for ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Now again, we, um, uh, the, the traditional view of the book of Hebrews is that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. This is what most of our Protestant fathers believed before us, our, our Baptist fathers believed before us. Um, and this might have been one of those times when Paul suffered persecutions in Jerusalem among the Hebrews or, or among some Hebrew community abroad. But an apostate, we see, will not associate themselves with Christians who are in persecution. 
they will not, it's not only that they will not suffer persecution for Christ's sake himself, but neither will they suffer persecution for the friendship of Christians. They won't want to be the friends of, of Christians who are being persecuted, partly whilst you became companions of them who were so used. In Job 16, verse 20, it says, My friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. This man, this man Job, patient Job, who, who trusted in God even throughout all of that, it says his friends scorned him. As soon as affliction arise, as soon as, as the persecutions of the devil arose, his friends abandoned him. And, and even the friends who came near to him, they accused him. They, they said that he must have been a sinner, that, 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 that surely he, uh, he was, was not a righteous man. Uh, and so they took away the righteousness of the righteous from him. They, they made themselves the, the, um, the uh, accusers of Job. And so apostates, again, will avoid the company of genuine believers when those believers are afflicted. But these true believers joyfully accept the company of those who are afflicted. Again, it's just the opposite. It's just that comparison. A, a disingenuous believer will leave at the first sign of persecution, at the first sign of trouble for the word of God, but a genuine believer will stick it out. A genuine believer will remain by faith. In Romans 12, verse 5, it says, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Because we are one body in Christ, we are one people, we are brought together by his blood, therefore it says, let love be without dissimulation. Let, let the love between believers be without abandoning one another. And so there's another difference that this church that we're, we're talking about, they first had comfort against this warning by looking to the past. They were able to look at their church when they had that fight of affliction, when they had believers come who were uh, so abused by the world that they did not disband. They did not scatter to and fro. They accepted even, uh, even those that had worse afflictions than them. And, and they, they stayed together. They were faithful and they persevered even through that affliction. And so the church corporately had this evidence to look to, that they were a genuine church, that they were a church of believers. And so what's another evidence that they were given? They were also given an evidence by the promise of a future reward. In verse 34, it says, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. They knew that they had a better reward in Jesus Christ. And so they could love their brother uh, at whatever cost, whatever it cost them, whatever possessions they had to give up. They could continue to follow Jesus Christ and love their brothers no matter what it costs. In 1 Peter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. The believer who has been born again has a lively hope in himself. They, they, these believers had a lively hope, a, a, a hope that gave them life, that reminded them of the promise in Jesus Christ, of an inheritance eternal in the heavens for them. And so it says in verse 35, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. He says, Do not turn from this faith, because this faith is worth it. In verse 36, For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, 
and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Your reward will come soon. Uh, Do not give up on the faith because it is worth it, because there's a reward at the end of it, and your reward comes soon. It will not tarry forever. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I'd like to apply this again to their situation that they had when they had that fight of affliction, when they had to give up uh, from themselves for the sake of fellowship with the church, for the sake of the faith of Christ. The reason they were able to do that and they were, to, they were able to abide the robbing of themselves, that, as, as, our, as our passage says, the reason they were able to do that is because their true possession was not here. It wasn't on the earth. Their final and full possession was in Jesus Christ, was by the blessing of him through faith. And so when they were willing to give from themselves, when they were willing for the soldiers to come in and take what they had, when they were willing to to be shunned by the community of, of the Jews for the sake of Jesus Christ and their brethren, they knew as a congregation that their faith was genuine. Again, that they were true Christians, that they were a true church of Jesus. And so that hope that was in each of the believers there, that they would have this uh, this inheritance in the future, it showed them that their faith was genuine, that their church's faith was genuine. Finally, we uh, we have the final and I think the greatest comfort here for a church and that is the great comfort of faith in the present of faith that we have today in verse 38 it says now the just shall live by faith now what's this mean where what how else is this passage used in the scripture this is an old testament quotation that's used three times in the new testament once in romans once here and once in the book of galatians and in galatians 3 11 It tells us what this quotation means. It says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. You see, we're again not saved because we do all of these works. These believers were not saved because they endured that great fight of affliction or because they were willing to give up their earthly possessions. That's not the reason they were forgiven of their sins. The reason they were forgiven of their sins is by immediately trusting in Jesus Christ because they had an abiding faith in him. Therefore, their sins were forgiven. And this is the greatest comfort that anyone can have. Uh, not just for a church who sees the faith of each other by the works that we do, but for individuals as well. Because we know that we trust in Jesus Christ, that we have entrusted our souls into his care. Therefore, we have the greatest comfort. We, we know that we will finally persevere in the end. In verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. If anyone draws back from this, if anyone does not trust in Jesus Christ, God doesn't have any pleasure in them. God, doesn't, God does not respect their person because they have not trusted in Jesus Christ. Their works are insufficient for him. Their, their church attendance is insufficient to save their soul. In Galatians 3.11, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. And so again, as uh, as individuals, this uh, faith is all that we need for the saving of our souls individually. And if anyone draw back from the faith, God's God has no pleasure 
in them. His soul has no pleasure in them. But where is the comfort in this? In verse 39, But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We, you and your neighbor today, are not of them who leave the faith. We're not of those who have left the faith. We're not of those who go off to, to go and sin. Those who commonly come here to worship with us in this place, we know that right now they are not of those who have drawn back. They are not of those who have gone into perdition. In 1 John 2.19 it says, and speaking of the apostates again, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Those apostates went out as an evidence that they were not genuine Christians, that, 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 that they did not trust in Jesus. And so, we who come here tonight, we who are demonstrating that we do trust in Jesus Christ, we that, that, have, that have devoted our time to coming together and serving Christ in this place, we show that we are not of those, that we're not of them that draw back, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. In 1 John 3, 18, it says, My little children, let us not love the world, neither in tongue, let us not love in word, rather, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Again, that church, they didn't just love one another in word. They didn't just uh, love one another in tongue, but in deed. They, they, they loved one another, their fellow church members, by gathering together and associating with each other. And they loved Jesus Christ also by what they did. They demonstrated that love that they genuinely had for Jesus, that faith they had in him by what they did. And so, believers, tonight, if we're worrying about each other's salvation here, this, of course, is a good thing we've seen throughout the book of Hebrews. We ought to worry for one another. We ought to care for one another. But tonight, let's also take comfort in this, that we're here together now, that we had many uh, who were here with us this morning and are faithful to come and worship on Sunday morning. And let's recognize that perseverance in the faith. Let's recognize that they are not of them who draw back unto perdition. They are not of them who have drawn back unto perdition, but them that believe to the saving of the soul. And so let's take comfort in that together for our church. And I'd also like to note that we should also not draw back from proclaiming the gospel. We can see that some in the church have drawn back and, and gone into perdition. But as a church, as a corporate body, let's not draw back from pro proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. Let's not draw back from that principle of faith in him. But rather, as part of our perseverance in the faith, let's proclaim it to each other. Let's be sure of one another by preaching the gospel to one another and then by preaching the gospel to those that we know. And so, believers, I pray that the Lord would help us in this task together. And now if there's an unbeliever here, we read just a moment ago that the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. If you draw back from the faith tonight, if, if as an unbeliever, you do not trust in Jesus, if you let this pass you by once again, then it says that the Lord has no pleasure in him. Let, let's not be as those that draw back, as those that shy away from faith in Jesus Christ, but rather let's put our trust in him. As simple as that is, let's, let's trust in Jesus Christ and win our soul by that. In Romans 10 verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And so I pray that you would not be ashamed, that you would not draw back, but that you would trust in his name tonight. And again, believers, let's go from this place and let's take comfort again uh, in our church that I believe that on a whole that we are a genuine church, that we are a church of believers, and that we are not of them that draw back, but them that believe to the saving of the soul. And so let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer. Father, again, we come before you and we thank you for the word of God that we've read. We thank you for also our fellow church members here tonight. Uh, Lord, and those who were here this morning, and uh, Lord, that are surely watching on the live stream right now. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would be with them to keep them in their sicknesses. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would bring them back uh, swiftly to us to uh, worship again. And Lord, we just pray that in all that uh, all of us say and do, that you would be glorified this week. And we ask in Christ's name all of this.